So there's a lot of people saying that my channel hasn't been showing up in their YouTube subscription feed. And my first thought on that is, why on earth would you use YouTube subscription feed? I use YouTube notifications. It's a little app that you load into, into Chrome. I'm sure there are other apps like this that just give you a dumb feed of your subscriptions. Use something like this. Don't depend on sites like YouTube or Facebook or Twitter to deliver the content to you. Always use some sort of third-party software that'll just give you a dumb feed that's not optimized, quote-unquote, TM. So Eric Turkheimer went on the David Pakman show. Now, David Pakman is a very stupid person who said very stupid things and asked very stupid questions and talks as if he's low IQ. So nobody cares about this guy. But Turkheimer, early on in his presentation there, repeated the old nostrum about socioeconomic status and the heritability of IQ. And we we found we didn't really find it there there was a large american twin study that included a lot of twin children raised in poverty and what we found in that study is that among very poor children the heritability of intelligence, the proportion that seemed to be accounted for by genes was very, very low. It was lower than 40%. It was close to 0% in the poorest children. And then as you proceed up to through the middle class into the upper middle class, there weren't a lot of rich people in this study, genes became more and more important, accounted for more and more of the variants where, so by the time you got to the upper middle class, things had almost completely reversed. Okay, Turkheimer is deliberately and knowingly lying here. His and Roe from 1999's results have failed replication at least four times since their publication. Three of them were from 2004 and 2005. And so given how long it takes to set up and perform a study, these were clearly replication attempts of Turkheimer 2003. One was done in 2005 by McGue et al. looking at 409 adoptive and 208 non-adoptive families from the sibling interaction and behavior study. And in this they say, quote, However, restriction in range in parent disintegratory psychopathology and family socioeconomic status had no effect on adoptive sibling correlations for delinquency, drug use, and IQ. Later on in there, he had a neat little chart comparing the IQs of offsprings based on their parent socioeconomic status, and it was found that yes, if your biological parent is poor, then you tend to have a low IQ, but it doesn't matter if it's the adopting parent. So being raised in a low socioeconomic status household did not depress IQ. Another replication attempt of Turkheimer was done by Negotian Johnson in 2004 in Hawaii, and it looked at 949 Caucasian and 400 Japanese families, and they found that lower socioeconomic status families did not have lower heritability, saying, quote, In contrast to the findings of Turkheimer et al. 2003, there was no evidence in these data familiarity for cognitive abilities was lower in the lower as opposed to upper levels of socioeconomic status. Status. These results were consistent across measures, ethnicity, and sex of offspring. Dot, dot, dot. The present findings provide almost no confirmation of the findings of Turkheimer et al. that the heritability of intelligence is greatly attenuated in the lowest ranges of socioeconomic status while maximized in the highest ratings. These HFSC results were consistent across gender and racial ethnic group, and there was no indication that this effect was more pronounced in one domain of specific cognitive abilities than another. Another apparent replication attempt was published in 2005 by Asbury, Wax and Plowman, and they found the opposite of Turkheimer's findings, stating, quote, We conclude that gene-environment interaction exists for verbal ability in early childhood and tends to be in the direction of greater heritability in high-risk environments. And they then go on to clarify, For socioeconomic status, group heritability was greater for the lowest 15% socioeconomic status group, 81%, as compared to the highest 15% group, 49%. A result in the opposite direction from Roe, 1999, and Turkheimer, 2003. However, although a difference in the same direction was also seen at the 25% cutoff, the other cutoffs yielded no real differences in heritability, suggesting that any effect is only seen at the extremes. Close quote. And in 2016, a study by Bates, Hansel, Martin, and Wright did a study on 2,352 twins in Australia and found Turkheimer's findings 
were once again not replicated, saying, quote, mean IQ scores were modestly higher among those from higher socioeconomic status backgrounds, but the magnitude of genetic influences in IQ was uniformly high across the range of socioeconomic status. They found virtually zero relation between socioeconomic status and heritability of IQ, with their estimate for, so for SES moderation being about zero and the upper and lower bound being virtually identical in each direction. After making most of this video, I found another study on Florida from 2017. It had a staggering sample size of 24,640, with 25.6% of the sample being black and 18% being Hispanic, which combined to 43.6% black or Hispanic. From the abstract of the study, quote, One widely reported idea is increasing genetic influence on cognition for children raised in higher socioeconomic status families, including recent proposals that the pattern is a particularly U.S. phenomenon. We used matched birth and school records from Florida siblings and twins born in 1994 to 2002 to provide the largest, most population diverse consideration of this hypothesis to date. We found no evidence of socioeconomic status moderation of genetic influence on test scores, suggesting that articulating gene environment interactions for cognition is more complex and elusive than previously supposed. Now to me, this sounds like a very polite way of saying, Turkheimer, you're a fucking hack but I won't put words in their mouth. So then they have a wonderful table with an important column right here showing the correlation between socioeconomic status and heritability. And oh look, it's negative for all groups, meaning that the heritability is higher the lower down the socioeconomic status you go, the exact opposite direction of what Turkheimer needs for his hypothesis to be true. And they explain in the table, the scar row and Turkheimer Hypothesis requires A prime to be positive and statistically significant. Oh, but it's not. It's it's negative. Wah, wah, wah. Now, keep this in mind when you hear this next stuff coming from Turkheimer. That finding, just by the way, has replicated quite well in the United States, where we have a lot of economic and educational inequality, not so much in Europe, where they have a better safety net. Right. Well, no. First off, McGew, the McGew study was done in Minnesota, and the Hawaii study was done in Hawaii, and the one we just talked about was done in Florida. And so we could dismiss Turkheimer's bald-faced lie here, and it is a lie. He knows about this. This is a lie. But that's not enough because this is a completely bullshit exclusion criteria. As has been shown in the voucher studies, meaningful educational inequality in the United States is a myth. Lottery voucher studies show that students who apply and receive a voucher do no better than students who apply but don't receive a voucher. The school you go to just doesn't matter. And in terms of economic inequality, okay, the US is about 6.6% .6 more economically unequal than the United Kingdom. How much do you think that matters? And also, is that just an effect of the greater racial diversity in the United States? And he brings up a bigger welfare net. Okay, well first, I'd be interested in knowing just how much bigger it actually is and how much it actually supplements income compared to the United States. And then, some sort of evidence that this actually matters. Because based on the studies so far, three of them in the United States, it doesn't look like this actually matters. Given just how comprehensively Turkheimer results have failed replication, which Turkheimer obviously knows about, Turkheimer is knowingly lying when he goes on to this show and builds on his 2003 results as if this is some kind of established finding that everyone agrees with. Most researchers don't agree with this. This is actually a fringe view that Turkheimer has, upheld by two studies that have failed replication at least four times that I have been able to find. So when Turkheimer postures like this is some established thing, that is very dishonest, and he is misleading the audience for political reasons. Now, he's not mistaken. He's not just making a boo-boo. He is deliberately lying to the audience on this point, okay? He's not just forgetting. He knows about all this, and he's not letting the audience know the full extent of the research on this topic. Why is he doing this? Well, let's just listen to the man himself, some things he himself has said, and we can get an idea 
idea as to why he would mislead the audience in this way. Quote, if it is ever documented conclusively the genetic inferiority of a race, his way of looking at it, not mine, on a trait as important as intelligence will rank with the atomic bomb as the most destructive scientific discovery in human history. The correct conclusion is to withhold judgment. But that was from 1990, you say, 28 years ago. I had just been born when he said that, so okay. What has he said recently? Well, here's something from 2007, only 11 years ago. Quote, when the theoretical questions are properly understood, proponents of race science, while entitled to their freedom of inquiry and expression, deserve the vigorous disapprobation they often receive. Hopefully, I am beginning to offend you. Why? Why don't we accept racial stereotypes as reasonable hypotheses okay to consider until they have been scientifically proven false? They are offensive precisely because they violate our intuition about the balance of innateness and self-determination of the moral and cultural qualities of human beings. Well, first Stuff. I disagree with his notion of intuition, but and I think the historical record speaks against Turkheimer's claims of intuition here, but continuing. No reasonable person would be offended by the observation that African people have curlier hair than the Chinese, notwithstanding the possibility of some future environment in which it is no longer true. But we can recognize a contention that Chinese people are genetically predisposed to be better table tennis players than Africans as silly, and the contention that they are smarter than Africans as ugly, because it is a matter of ethical principle that individual and cultural accomplishment is not tied to the genes in the same way as the appearance of our hair. It is a matter of ethical principle that individual and cultural accomplishment is not tied to the genes in the same way as the appearance of our hair. Well, he really uh, lays it out there, doesn't he? Now, I'm going to go on a bit of a digression here and say that Turkheimer is just factually wrong about this. I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but here's just uh, some snippets from a preprint that was posted this January on the accuracy of demographic stereotypes by Lee Jasim, Stevens, and Honeycutt. And they found that, quote, four studies assess the accuracy of racial and ethnic stereotypes for specific judgments. Consensual discrepancies were accurate for a plurality or majority majority of all judgments. There is more evidence of underestimating than of exaggerating differences in three studies. One found more evidence of exaggerating real differences. One study reported personal discrepancies from perfection. Ashen and S's 2009 found that by our standards, 36 participant stereotypes were accurate, 33 were exaggerated of real differences, and 25 underestimated real differences. Although they also used several other standards which differed from ours, this pattern of slightly more exaggeration than underestimation estimation occurred no matter what standard they used. Two studies reported results from which consensual correlations could be readily computed. In Ryan's research, the consensual stereotypes correlated from about 0.5 to 0.8 with self-report criteria. In the Macaulay and Stitt study, consensual stereotypes correlated 0.27 to 0.96 with U.S. Census data with a median of 0.83. Two studies also assessed personal stereotype accuracy correlations. Ryan found such correlations to average about 0.4, whereas Ashton and Esses found them to average 0.69. Now remember that in social science, anything with a correlation of 0.3 or above is considered to be a medium effect. Anything with a 0.5 or above correlation is considered to be a large effect. And also remember that the correlation between mid-parent height with gender controls and the height of the offspring is 0.47, right? So the gender corrected height correlation with the average of your parents, that correlation is only 0.47. So when looking at stereotype accuracy, keep in mind that it's a bit more accurate than the correlation between your height and the average of your parents' heights, gender controlled. And also keep in mind just how powerful a 0.47 correlation is in the real world, sort of intuitively what that feels like. So that was a long digression, but I wanted to make the point that Turkheimer is just the man who is wrong. He said some things about stereotypes not being true back in 2007, something that was never established. It's just something that cat ladies in the school system like to say, and it turned out to be complete horseshit. But then Turkheimer just just says it. He just goes around saying it. And this is something that's going to get more infuriating and very hypocritical, as we'll see later on. Anyway, 
Back to Turkheimer, openly stating his ideological opposition to science, I had a quote from 1990, a quote from 2007, but that's 28 and 11 years ago. Anything more recent? Well, here's a 2018 quote from an article he wrote where he said, quote, I should be clear that I am not making a both sides do it argument. It is the hereditarians who are trying to reach a strong and potentially destructive conclusion, and the burden is absolutely on them to demonstrate that they have a well-grounded empirical and quantitative theory to work with. So, if you are out there and think that group differences are at least partially genetic, please explain exactly what you mean in empirical terms, dot dot dot. Declaring something to be a science doesn't make it so. The hereditarians want all the good things that come from being thought of as scientists. They want academic respect. They want protection from charges of racism. They want a clear separation from the very recent history of quote-unquote race science that led directly to the Holocaust and Jim Crow. They have to earn it by doing the hard work of developing the quantitative and empirical theories that transform intuitions about stereotypes into real science. Now, of course, this has already been done to death, and Turkheimer's work has been empirically blown out of the water, but here it all comes out. This is what it's all about. Now, of course, we know that if Germany accepted conventional thinking of race that existed in the West, they would not have considered Slavic peoples to be subhuman, and the Nazi views on Jews had nothing to do with race and IQ. And when you think about it, isn't that something? The most persecuted group by the Nazis were not persecuted because they had low IQs, but because they were smart. Too smart, in fact. And said to be dishonest usurpers of institutions who took over host countries like a parasite for their own ends, right? That narrative, that sort of parasite takeover of the Jews narrative, has nothing to do with IQ. In fact, in Nazi Germany, they threw out Western IQ tests and they replaced it with a test that had two parts. An information section, where they just ask you a bunch of general knowledge questions, and an interview where the test taker's intelligence was subjectively assessed by the interviewer. Which is to say, the Nazis basically didn't use IQ tests at all in the way we conceive of them. And there are, of course, no validity or reliability studies with any of this. So in addition to Turkheimer just making an appeal to consequence, which we all know is a formal fallacy, and so there's no reason to belabor the point. Yes, Turkheimer is making a formal fallacy here, and so we should just dismiss what he says just based on that ground alone. But I want to sort of double dunk on that and say it's also just historically incorrect, right? Just think about how absurd this is. You have a regime in Nazi Germany that rejected IQ tests, who rejected IQ data showing Slavs to be very close to Germans in IQ, whose main target for extermination was the highest IQ population in Europe, and Turkheimer's concerned that t people talking about race IQ differences could result in the behavior of a regime that explicitly rejected IQ tests as we know of them. And given how important this is for Turkheimer, and given that he's supposedly some kind of researcher, supposedly, you'd think he may want to know what the Nazi regime actually did before going ham. And if we're in the business of comparing our opponents with regimes that bear passing resemblances to them, okay, well, what's the kill count of the Soviet Union and Maoist China or the Khmer Rouge? Not only were those kill counts higher, but they were more recent and they were all about equality. Now, Turkheimer would say rightly that he's not any of those people. Okay, well, none of the people you're calling Nazis are Nazis either. Denial of biological inequality and biological differences is what led to these beliefs that all economic inequality was a result of some injustice in these places. And this was then used as a casus belli against anyone who was economically successful, which made it okay to first take all of their stuff because all of their wealth was ill-gotten, and second, to kill them if that's what was needed for the cause. And I say this here, and it all sounds very academic, but as we know, this is what actually happened, and it had very real results. So in terms of who's practically dangerous, how could you not say it's Turkheimer's views? How could you not say it's this radical equalist idea that is dangerous? And in terms of what's going on and who actually has power in the United States today, who is a threat today, Turkheimer's focus is on something that poses zero threat and that he knows poses zero threat. He knows. He knows this. But he's focusing on it anyway because of something irrational and something emotional within him. He says this isn't a scientific question, and of course, for him, it isn't. It's not even a question of harm, because if he was concerned about harm, he would be concerned about what's most likely to result in some sort of catastrophe, and that is equality-based ideas.
Now, here's another thing that Turkheimer does that is super dishonest. He conveys to the audience that you have to find the genes to talk about race differences in cognitive ability. Uh, well, if, if you mean biological race, then no. I, I, I believe strongly that we don't. I mean, it, it, it certainly is social aspects of race and the history of slavery and discrimination. I mean, in some ways, that's race. But uh, presuming you mean race as a biological construct, I feel very strongly that it doesn't and that it's, in fact, irresponsible for people to speculate that it might be. And my, my strongest feeling about that is that based on the kind of data that we can generate in human beings, it's, it's, not, re it's not only that there's no evidence that that's true, Oh, that's the case. There is no evidence that that's true. It's also that there's no possible evidence that it's true. It's not like we're waiting for somebody to complete a study that it's, that's going to be decisive. What type of evidence would tell us that IQ differences between races are specifically because of race? Is that even a possibility? I mean, here, here, here's the way I think that could turn out to be true. I mean, and it, I don't, and I, and my point is that this is very unlikely to happen. If if we some what what doesn't exist, even though IQ is heritable, like everything is everything about people is heritable. There are no in the normal range, aside from Down syndrome and things like that. There are in the normal range, the difference between your IQ and mine. There are no known genetic mechanisms that determine your IQ. That oh well, okay. Uh, this, per, you know, David has genes X, Y, and Z, and Eric has genes A, B, and C, and we know that it's always true that people with X, Y, Z genes have higher IQs than A, B, C genes, and we, especially if we ever understood the mechanism, because you can see, here's what X, Y, Z genes do to your brain, and enhance the neurons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and because of that, people with those genes are smarter pretty much all the time, not contingent on anything else. If that were true, well, then you could find a group of people that had those genes and a group of people that didn't have those genes and say, well, the difference between those groups seems like it's caused by those genes. Uh, I mean, and that might apply to American blacks and whites, and it might not, but it's an explained difference between some groups, groups that have them and groups that don't have them. Now, he knows this is wrong. If you go back to what he himself said about heritability, he correctly defined heritability. You know, we're, we're talking about a quantity that's called a heritability that varies from zero to one and tells you, tells you within a lot of complications about the proportion of differences in people that are accounted for by differences in our genes. I, uh, one way I like to think about it is it tells you how much more similar we would all be if we were all clones. And, and it's easy to think when you start thinking about these numbers that IQ or any trait has a heritability and we do science to find out if the heritability of IQ is 60% or 70% or 40% or 20% and that's wrong. Mm. IQ doesn't have a heritability. The heritability of IQ depends on the situation in which you measure it and that depends on how much people vary genetically and environmentally. So, in fact, if you gave an IQ test to a bunch of clones, I mean, that's not possible in humans, you know, a, a huge set of identical twins, everybody exactly the same, the heritability would be zero because everyone is genetically the same and differences in genes can't account for everything. This is useful, and I'm going to cut this clip out so when some idiot tries to say that heritability doesn't have anything to do with genetics, I can just point out that even Turkheimer explains heritability exactly as I do, which makes sense as this is just what heritability heritability means and all it could possibly mean. But he goes from understanding heritability as an explanation of phenotypic variance as a function of genetic variance, but then goes on to heavily imply that you have to find the genes to say anything about race differences. This retarded standard would not only invalidate any heritability estimate for anything, including height by the way, it would invalidate any claims of anything being a function of genetic differences in any context that we have up to this point, except for the very simplest of 
of traits, meaning traits that are a function of almost single genes. And in Turkheimer's own studies, he puts the general heritability of IQ within the United States somewhere around 40%. Now, I think it's around 80%, and I have a video defending this number linked in the description if you care. But my point is that Turkheimer's own work, he comes up with heritability estimates that do not meet this molecular genetics standard, where you got to find the genes and find all the genetic mechanisms. But then he goes on to say that to find the heritability of race differences in IQ, in that situation, then you have to find the genes and find the specific genetic mechanism that you cannot infer anything from, from studies, except whoops, he doesn't actually say that because if you watch the clip, he's very careful. He says that what we don't have is, and then he goes into all this molecular genetic stuff. He points out how we don't have the direct slam dunk molecular genetics data. And this is very slimy because he conveys to the audience that this is what you have to have. You have to find the genes to say anything about genetic differences between the races, but he covers his ass professionally by not outright saying that you have to find the genes to make heritability estimates. Because this standard of having to find the specific genetic mechanism for anything would invalidate in a stroke the entire fields of sociology, psychology, and most of biology. Even most of genetics would not meet this standard. Any genome wide association study would not meet this standard because genome wide association studies don't infer specific mechanisms. They just create predictive models based on genetic correlates. He then says that people talking about race differences will never meet this standard. And there's a very good chance he's correct because nobody can meet this fucking standard. Nobody can meet this standard. And he brings this requirement for specific genetic mechanism up only in the context of race differences in IQ. In no other context does this requirement does he bring this up? But then, of course, in order to save his corny ass, he doesn't outright say that you have to have this. He just sort of implies it to the audience, but is careful not to explicitly say that you have to have this. But the audience is going to come away thinking you do. Idiots like Kraut and idiots like Pac-Man are going to come away thinking you do, not realizing that Turkheimer is a fucking hack. Or to put it more bluntly, Turkheimer doesn't actually believe this, but he wants you to believe it because he wants you to believe in fucking creationism. Now, if one should be biased, it should be in the direction direction of evolution, simply because we know evolution is true, and there's no reason to think evolution stopped at the neck. And that glib line that I have there, stopped at the neck, that actually gives Turkheimer too much credit, because Turkheimer's position is actually stupider than thinking evolution stopped at the neck, because he recognizes evolution and genetically based intelligence differences in people generally. He recognizes heritability. He also recognizes that there can be genetically based differences between two arbitrarily defined groups of people, people who live on this side of the tracks versus that side of the tracks, or people whose ancestors came from this or that side of the tracks. He recognizes that there can be genetically based differences between those two groups from ancestral origins. But as soon as the groups being compared correspond to traditional races, then it's, oh, what we don't have are the exact genes and the exact neurological functions that these genes do. What doesn't exist, even though IQ is heritable. And it's so transparent if you have any semblance of any kind of a brain. And of course, Turkheimer himself is careful not to explicitly even say so. And given the predictions about the effects of immigrant groups entering into Europe, for example, that you had these idiot politicians saying, oh, we need to bring in a bunch of Africans and Arabs to help with our budgets, help with our budget issues. They'll integrate just fine. We're not racist like the Americans. So these people will be a great asset. And of course, the result of this mass immigration to Europe has been manifest, exactly as ye old racists said would happen. Back when the 1965 Immigration Act was passed, you had people saying, oh, we're only going to need affirmative action for about 10 years to undo the effects of past injustices. Of course, implying there actually were past injustices, but that's another topic for another time. The idea that segregation actually was unfair to blacks, but, but of course, those predictions turned out to be completely wrong. There has been zero progress, contra Turkheimer, and I'll get into his claims to the contrary later. But basically, all the predictions of the quote-unquote racists have come to pass, and all of the predictions of the integrationists and the egalitarians have completely failed. 
And given that we believe in evolution, we certainly would never expect that groups of people, whether or not they're genetically distant enough to pass some threshold by which we call them subspecies or something else, is irrelevant. They're obviously something that evolved in different regions of the planet, and so they're different in all sorts of ways. To imagine that this would not extend to the brain is just retarded. To take that as your starting, take that as a default assumption, you gotta ask yourself a question. Do you believe in evolution or not? So if we should have any bias in any direction, it should be in the direction of the evolutionary explanation, not this Marxoid 1970s sociological mysticism or environmental determinism and sort of deep, fragile psychology. So throughout the rest of the video, he basically just says that if you recognize divergent evolution in humans, you're a bigot or a fool. So what I want to do here is give the viewer something to think about. All of world history has been a clash of nationalisms. Now, how humans group themselves is not always the same. There's all sorts of shifting alliances based on religion, race, language, tradition, and non-religious political beliefs. Now, elsewhere, I kind of argue that over time, the primacy of race asserts itself. And that race over time comes to dominate even these factors. But that's not exactly germane here. But at the end of the day, it's always some primitive gut level nationalism that wins out. Pure ideology will flash up from time to time, but some sort of old nationalism always reasserts itself. In the Soviet Union, you say communism. Well, that's cute, but eventually it just became the Russian Empire 2.0. And it even had an economic system very similar to that of Tsarist Russia, which Western who were ignorant of what the economic system was like in Tsarist Russia could say, oh, this is communism or something. And in practice, it was Russia trying to maintain the Russian, oh, excuse me, Soviet Empire, or excuse me, Confederation of Freeborn Republics. And as soon as the Russian grip slackened, all of these countries left the quote-unquote Soviet Union immediately. And today, we talk about China and the state of China acting in the interests not of the global working class, not the global third world as was Mao's supposed grand vision, which is ever more distant for China as China's economy rises to the genetic IQ potential of around 105, while Africa remains poor due to their genetic IQ potential being around 81. We see China acting as a nationalist empire, not a champion of the third world because it's not the third world. It was destined to escape being in the third world simply because their IQ is too high or their genetic IQ potential is too high. In Mexico, sure, you have a lot of talk down there about socialism and oppression narratives, but these oppression narratives are not only done side by side with Mexican nationalism, but it's intrinsic to it. because There's always some sort of narrative of Mexican oppression at the hands of the United States. So even in places where the global communist revolution supposedly takes hold, nationalism wins. And what ends up happening is that the communist movement just ends up being a tool for some nation state. Or to put it in cuckface lingo, communism just ends up as fascism, which is to say that everything is fascism and that you're only opposed to white fascism. So you're not really anti-fascist because everything's fascism. You're just against white fascism, but that means nothing because everything's fascist. So really you're just against white. You're just anti-white. And this is Turkheimer's role. Like the Bolsheviks just ended up being a sleeve for Russian nationalism, people like Turkheimer are just a sleeve for the racial nationalisms of anyone who wants to take something from whites. That's his purpose. Turkheimer is a tool for brown racists. He's a dupe for brown racists. When you see people talking about the problem of whiteness, of white privilege, and then trot out a laundry list of real, imagined, and exaggerated past grievances against white people, and never mention all the things that white people did for the world, ending slavery, creating the Industrial Revolution, holy shit, created the entire world past the level of feudalism. They never mention any of that. They just talk about all of these real, imagined, and exaggerated bad things some white people did somewhere. Well, think in history what this is a prelude to. When one group starts listing off grievances against another group, what is this always a prelude to? It's a prelude to some kind of attack against the group that you are listing grievances against. And if you want to say, no, this is not like that. We're, we're, <clears throat> we're past nationalism, right? We're past nationalism now. It's all about equality and tolerance and acceptance and unicorns and rainbows and puppies and pink clouds. Now, remember that this song and dance has been done 
many times before. And it always leads to a lot of suffering and then a reassertion of someone's nationalism. That's always how this ends. In the US, white people are the only group of people who can be legally discriminated against. This was not true under Jim Crow. Discrimination was allowed for anyone. Black people could have black only spaces. But in the US, white people are the only people who can be discriminated against. They can be discriminated against by anyone and are the only group for whom it is illegal to form racially exclusive neighborhoods or community spaces. Which is to say, white people are the only race who are legally prohibited from having a safe space. Some bigot like me points out these double standards and the retort is of course, tut tut, don't you know about the historical context? But what happens when I challenge the historical context that are used to justify these anti-white race laws? Well, that's not allowed. Or I bring up data on slavery, I bring up data on segregation, say no, they weren't put upon, they just suck. When I say this, well then you have an entire anti-white movement that's based on historical claims, which can never be questioned, because as soon as someone starts questioning them, then they're just a racist revisionist hack. And so the circle is complete. With Hitler, his narrative was Germans being oppressed at the hands of the Jews. IQ tests said, no, Jews are just smarter. And Hitler then dismissed traditional IQ tests and came up with bogus, Nazified intelligence tests. So this brilliant man, Turkheimer, comes along and says that blacks are oppressed at the hands of the whites. IQ tests say, no, whites are just smarter. Now, some people do what the Nazis did, and they just come up with fake intelligence tests. They come up with multiple intelligences bullshit or the bitch test, and I have articles on that, showing how dumb those are. Others just outright deny IQ, right? Which is impossible to do given that IQ is the most well-supported psychological metric ever and has survived more opposition than any other psychometric. To put it another way, if your standards were such that IQ is invalidated, then those standards would invalidate the rest of psychology because nothing is more proven and reliable than IQ. But Turkheimer, what he does is he just goes with this old nationalist revanchist storytelling saying that it's the oppression itself that is causing the lower IQ. So it's perfect, it's perfect. So he says, blacks in the US are oppressed. The long arm of slavery and Jim Crow still affects them. Some guy responds, okay, well, US blacks have lower IQs. Maybe that's why they're poor. No, it's the oppression itself that is causing the lower IQs. But US blacks are wealthier than most white people on the planet are. No, see, the oppression is calibrated in such a way as to drive black IQ down below that of Eastern Europeans, but not below them in material wealth. Their material wealth is driven down to a value similar to what whites with an IQ of 85 happen to earn in the United States. This is just a coincidence. Isn't it odd that the oppression of blacks in the US pushes black income to the same level as you would predict from their IQ, which is itself a product of this oppression. That the effect of the oppression on IQ and on income line up to the exact values you, you would expect from a white population with that average IQ. What a coincidence. You're seeing exactly what you would expect to see if blacks weren't actually oppressed at all, but just for genetic reasons had a lower IQ and their economic outcomes reflected a median IQ of 85 within a more or less meritocratic economy within the United States. But no, Turkheimer would rather go with a much more roundabout and convoluted explanation that oppression, that this oppression is perfectly calibrated to where black IQ and income would match up like this. He knows heritability isn't lower for, so for lower socio economic status people. He knows that. He knows you don't have to find the genes to come up with reliable heritability estimate for racial IQ gaps, which is why he was so careful to not explicitly say so. And he's lying about the research because he's a dupe. He's duped into thinking he's left wing or is against oppression or any of the panoply of nationalist nostrums that have been used all throughout man's existence to justify some sort of attack on some other group. For Turkheimer though, there's no happy ending. There's no redemption arc here. He'll be paraded around and heralded by other white dupes as his research fades ever more into irrelevance. And hopefully with this video I've done here, I've done a little bit to try to make him irrelevant as a propaganda as well. There were some things that I didn't address regarding Turkheimer, one of which was the narrowing black white IQ gap, another was the myth about the use of IQ tests to influence US immigration policy, or the myth that even intelligence researchers themselves ever thought that IQ differences between European ethnic groups had any significant genetic component but those will be topics for an upcoming comprehensive series. Remember, 
get some third-party notification for your YouTube subscriptions or set up an RSS feed which you can use for YouTube or anything else. If you like this video and videos like this, consider donating to my Patreon, PayPal, or Maker Support. Patreon is done on a per video basis. The other two are done on a monthly basis. As that per video number on Patreon goes up, I'm getting closer and closer to being able to do this full time. Thanks for watching, and there's some significant stuff coming up.